no one can argue the point that, from a strictly biological point of view, the purpose, for lack of a better word, of living organisms is to reproduce, partially replicating themselves in the process. From the lowest orders of bacteria to the largest cetaceans, all the way through to the somewhat salient Homo sapiens, all organisms exist to replicate themselves. That man is an animal, little different in his drives and instincts from those of most other animals, shall not escape any intelligent observer. Despite all the lofty trappings of civilization, we too are animals existing to reproduce. I mention this because the purpose of this video is to sound out the origins of male disposability, utility to the female, and most importantly, why most of us seemingly cannot escape this paradigm of thought, try as some may, though admittedly most are not trying too hard. That most people attribute so much value to children is a testament to this. At the end of the day, the game we are playing is no different from that of any other animal, with the caveat that culture can and sometimes does delimit the, how the actual game is played. Having said that, let us now proceed forward. I must now ask for your patience, as much of what is to follow may appear a little uh, off topic and to bear little relation uh, to men's issues, but listen on and you will see where I am heading with it all. In this video, I seek to create a model of explanation for male disposability and inter-male hostility purely in terms of biology. To this end, I am going to examine a complex evolutionary process and its implications on the human male, both in terms of his evolution over time and modern man as he stands today, with his current place in society being the result of this evolutionary process. We will see that for all the power of politics and social pressure, neither of these things would have a fraction of the influence they do today were they not being directly informed by millions of years of biologically based behavioral drives that frankly most human beings are simply not cognizant of, let alone acknowledge as being the primary factor between, behind who we are today. To understand this, you must first understand the concept of Fisherian runaway in evolution and sexual selection and its implications on other species before turning to the human male. R.A. Fisher was an evolutionary biologist of the early 20th century whose work should be considered as important as Brifo's observations, if not more so in some regards. Fisherian runaway can be explained as follows. Fisher's explanation is that sexual selection of traits is a result of sexual preference, that members of the opposite sex find a trait desirable. This preference makes the trait advantageous, which in turn makes preferring the trait advantageous. The process is termed runaway because over time it would facilitate the development of greater preference and more pronounced traits until the cost of producing the trait balance the reproductive benefits, benefit of possessing it. For example, the peacock's tail requires a great deal of energy to grow and maintain. It reduces the bird's agility and it may increase the animal's visibility to predators, and yet it has evolved, indicating that birds with longer tails have some advantage. Fisherian runaway explains that if a peahen selects a peacock with a longer and more colorful tail, then her male children are more likely to have long and colorful tails, and are more likely to be sexually su successful themselves because other peahens have the same preference for longer tails. Given this pre-existing pattern, having a preference for longer and more colorful tails gives an advantage, just as having a longer and more colorful tail does. However, all the members of the species are less well off than they would be if none of the peahens, or only a small number, preferred a longer or more colorful tail, because in the absence of such a preference, the possession of these maladaptive traits, reducing mobility and increasing visibility to predators, would no longer be incentivized. As cited above, the example that comes most readily to mind is that of the male peacock. Thousands of generations of pe female peahens routinely favored peacocks with ostentatious plumage. Observe one aspect of Fisherian runaway is that a s over a sustained period of time, the sexual selection preferences of the female endow most male offspring with a sex-specific trait that can potentially provide a disadvantage to the male as far as survival is concerned, i.e. reduced mobility, hence greater susceptibility to predation whilst remaining desirable to the female of the species, meaning that the sexual selection preferences of the female can, over time, run counter to the traits enhancing physical survivability of the male in the case of peacocks. This is to say that the female will always be the one 
to incentivize certain traits, and this is no different in humans, whether they be beneficial to the male outside of the mating game or not. In the animal kingdom, of which we are certainly part, there are often pronounced conflicting interests between the sexes, not only in terms of reproductive strategies, but in some cases in the results of female mate selection preferences in relation to the male phenotype she prefers. This is, of course, directly related to part of Briefo's law. The female, not the male, determines all the conditions of the animal family. This means that in the case of peacocks, they evolved an adaptive trait which was elaborated upon by subsequent generations of peahens repeatedly selecting that trait, with the result being that the advantages of the plumage in males are strictly confined to attracting mates. This sex-selective advantage, however, comes at the cost of decreased mobility, but persists due to being incentivized by peahens. Peacocks are not yet extinct, however, so let us now turn to a species where fisherian runaway became an actual problem to survival eventually leading to extinction. Now that we have an overview, I will tell you the tale of the Irish elk, the largest cervid to have lived that died approximately 11,000 years ago in the early Holocene period. An often cited explanation for its extinction is directly tied to Fisherian runaway. I will now read an abstract of a scientific publication that details that extinction. Quote, adult male Irish elk grew the largest antlers of any extinct or extant cervid. These antlers have often been implicated in the extinction of the Irish elk, although the effects of antler growth on Irish elk physiology have not been analyzed quantitatively. We use a simulation model of energy and mineral metabolism to compare nutritional requirements for antler growth in Irish elk and moose, the largest extant cervid. The model simulates intake, metabolism, deposition, and excretion of energy, nitrogen, ash, calcium, and phosphorus, with mass balance for each of these nutrients on a daily time step. Predicted energy requirements for antler growth by moose are half as large as energy requirements for summer fat and protein deposition. In contrast, the predicted energy requirements for antler growth by Irish elk were about 75% as large as energy requirements for summer fat and protein deposition. Irish elk antlers weighing 40 kilograms at the end of velvet shedding would have contained 2.1 kilograms nitrogen, 7.6 kilograms calcium, and 3.8 kilograms phosphorus. The nitrogen requirements for antler growth were met by forage intake. The model predicts that to grow 40 kilograms of antlers in a 150-day period, more than 60 grams of calcium and more than 30 grams of phosphorus were deposited in antlers daily for 60 consecutive days when antler, uh, antler mineralization was highest in midsummer. Simulated Irish elk depleted skeletal mineral reserve to support antler growth more than extant moose, even when hypothesized adaptations to reduce skeletal mineral resorption were implemented. Even though Irish elk fit with the al allometric <coughs> relationship between antler size and body size in extant cervids, mineral metabolism does not scale al allometrically in the same manner. About 6% of the calcium and 10% of the phosphorus in the antler were resorbed from the skeleton because dietary intake of minerals was insufficient to meet requirements for antler mineralization. The minerals resorbed from the skeleton in summer would have been replenished by dietary intake over the following winter. Pollen records document a shift in plant species composition from an all-willow spruce com community during the Alarod interstitial to a tundra during the younger Dryas cold period with reduced forage density, uh, coincident with the extinction of the Irish elk about 10,600 years ago. The reduction in forage density would have made replenishing calcium and phosphorus in the skeleton even more difficult, as well as making it more difficult for male Irish elk to replenish fat reserves depleted during the rut. Sexual selection pressures for large antlers and larger body size were opposed by selection pressures for smaller antlers and smaller body size imposed by environmental change. We suggest that the inability to balance these opposing selection pressures in the face of rapid environmental change contributed to the extinction of the Irish elk 10,600 years before present. Let us first focus attention on the concept of allometric scaling. Allometric scaling is an anatomical feature that deviates from isometrical anatomical features meaning that certain species of cervids, deer, elk, moose, 
upon achieving a certain body mass will have antlers that exist in allometric relation to that body mass, i.e. the antlers will be disproportionately large to the actual body size of the animal. The male Irish elk, being the largest known cervid in terms of body mass, had correspondingly large antlers that were far larger than its own body, proportionally speaking. This is part of the Fisherian run runaway equation, as having an antler as large, larger than would be best suited to your body will impede movement by dint of excess weight, but these large antlers were favorable in terms of sexual selection, meaning the female Irish elk exhibited a selective preference for very large antlers. Moreover, they were used to int intimidate other males during male competition for female mates. Sexual selection pressure forced the Irish elk to cannibalize its own calcium and phosphorus reserves, which accordingly could only be repl replenished by nutrient intake from the environment it had adapted to. During the late Pleistocene, as intimated in the abstract, there was a change in the floral composition of the environment caused by changes in temperature, which resulted in the inability to replenish the can cannibalized calcium and phosphorus reserves. Eventually, the species went extinct because an adaptation to the new environment could not occur with, within the short fr frame time available. This is a perfect example of Fisherian runaway gone too far. For one, through mating with males that, uh, and bearing male Irish elk with female desired traits, female mate selection preference led to extremely allometric anatomical features in the male Irish elk, i.e. abnormally large and cumbersome antlers in relation to the body and skeleton which then forced the male to deplete its own bodily mineral, mineral reserves to maintain the required growth for said antlers, resulting in a state similar to osteoporosis. When climate change brought about, by a, sh brought about a shift in flora that formed a staple diet, diet of the Irish elk, the adaptive trait in male Irish elk became maladaptive, leading to its extinction. Now I want to focus on the human male, primarily in terms of his psychology as I'm going to argue that Fisherian runaway has been taking place in our species for a very long time, and that in recent decades, if not earlier, certain traits in the human male have become maladaptive. Fisherian runaway is not so much morphological in the human male as it is psychological. Let me summarize my proposition as follows. Just as with the Irish elk, the female human selects the male traits she finds desirable, male disposability being the primary one. Over many generations, those traits will not only be passed on to male offspring, but the selective preference traits of the female will also be passed on to female offspring. Male disposability is therefore a trait that has been sexually selected for repeatedly by past human females. A man's willingness to sacrifice and die, if need be, for the sake of the female, her being the limiting factor in reproduction, might have been detrimental to the man's well-being, but it was the quality desired by the female, and thus was favored over other traits, including any trait for self-preservation, meaning that primarily disposable males were given the opportunity to mate. And now you may be asking why I'm arguing that the human male currently finds himself in a fissuring runaway process, and the reason is fairly simple. Men throwing themselves in front of bullets and knives for the sake of women they do not know is one reason. Let me read off the following headline from an article, something that occurred in upstate New York a few months ago. Quote, heroic man sacrifices life to save a woman and her dog from drowning. A tragic event occurred today on the Seneca River near Onondaga Lake, outlet near Lysander, New York. Two men, a woman and a dog, were out boating when the dog jumped into the water and got caught in seaweed. The dog was unable to break free, so the woman jumped into the water to help but got caught in the weeds herself. One of the men threw her life preserver and then jumped in himself. He managed to free her and the dog. The rescued pair swam to the safety of a nearby buoy. Tragically, the heroic man was unable to get to safety and drowned. So here we have a man who threw away his life for the sake of a woman he did not know, and post-mortem was named a hero. The question that must be posed, however, is what residual benefit did the man have by committing this act of alleged heroism? If it had been his own child or pregnant wife, then one could at least argue along the lines of preservation of genetic legacy, and that is fairly common, but almost reflexively he threw his life away for a strange woman he did not know. And of course, there is another dimension to this. Men, whilst 
all too willing to bend over backwards for the sake of women, are unwilling, generally speaking, to lift a finger to help their fellow men. Men will not fel help their fellow men because virtually every man, taken from an evolutionary perspective, is a potential competitor for female reproductive resources. Once again, the men of the past who successfully mated possessed two traits that were repeatedly selected for by females. These traits were disposability to the female and a strong desire to compete and, when necessary, inflict violence on their fellow men. This is why most men will walk by the homeless guy he sees every day without so much as blinking, and why fast friendships soon turn to vicious rivalries the minute a female enters the equation. But let me offer a more concrete example, if anecdotally, of the manifestation of both of these traits. Oftentimes, when a man catches his girlfriend cheating, the man with whom the girlfriend cheated is targeted as the primary source of his rage and ire, not the woman. His anger, which would be better directed primarily at his unfaithful female partner, is redirected towards the male he did not know. After all, he's the competitor and must be eliminated at all costs. And there is a more sinister aspect to all this as well, namely that the individual male will regard his own life as essentially worthless and simultaneously the lives of other men who are at best who at best deserve to be torn to pieces by the man for the sake of female attention. This is part of our genetic legacy and why men have so much trouble looking out for each other. Recall also the study on female in-group preference. In the distant past, this sort of sacrifice and intramale conflict might have been necessary for the preservation of the species. As we all know, women being the limiting factor in reproduction would have been more valuable to the tribe. But in today's world of seven billion people, a highly mechanized and technologically advanced society, with conveniences and amenities that simply did not exist prior, the instinctual desire to sacrifice oneself as a man, be it his life or through excessive and dangerous labor, will often result in being counterproductive and dangerous to himself as an individual. Women's genetically predisposed traits have been elaborated upon as well in the last 50 years. Remember that the human female regards the human male primarily as a utility, be it in the form of a sperm donor, a financial provider, or physical laborer, and that all three of these functions have been partially or completely replaced by the state and the benefits of mechanization. There exist, for example, sperm banks where discerning women can look to in order to optimize their genetic legacy. No man involved. Women can and do work and can use the state to coerce monies from men they are married to. And much of the hard labor of the past has been done, aw has been done away with by the inventions of modernity. Women possessing the psychological and genetic trait to view men in terms of what men can offer them in light of the modern state of affairs can and will take the better offer should it come from elsewhere, meaning not from the man, rather, rather from the state, and indeed many have, irrespective of whether or not this was beneficial to individual men, uh, men as a whole, or the species in its totality. And let us not forget that much as service to the female as a genetically heritable trait was passed on to the vast majority of men by past women selecting servile men, so too was the trait of women seeking that service, meaning it runs both ways. And this is where we are today, and why I am proposing a kind of Fisherian runaway scenario for the human male that is now in the negative stages where a trait that was primarily advantageous strictly in terms of sexual selection has become maladaptive for the human male in the current political, cultural, and social climate. For reasons discussed often in past videos, the modern capital F feminist state is a reflection of the desires of lowercase f feminists meaning your everyday woman. But where are we today? The psychological trait of the female to seek to optimize her provision has been met by the state in large measure, and the psychological and sexually selected trait of male servility to female need has, as a consequence of an entire social structure dedicated to the female, been elaborated upon. This is indeed social conditioning, but it has its basis in biology. More so than ever, the man is willing to place female needs before his own because social discourse informed by biology strengthens the inherent genetic trait, which is why we have men jumping into rivers to save women they do not know, heedless of the dangers posed themselves. To see a concrete example of how male servility to the female can now be considered a maladaptive trait in the process of assuring runaway in modernity, let us look to suicide once again. 
Now, if you recall Barbarossa's video on the Cinderella lie uh, a few months ago, that video he presented a graph uh, based on the research of Thomas uh, Mortison. And looking at this graph, you can see a, see a sharp spike in the male suicide rate beginning in around 1970 and continuing unabated until the 1990s. It drops slowly after that, but the difference between male and female suicide uh, rates is still very pronounced. Now we can look at this as the result of political forces, no-fault divorce, politicized feminism, and, and a genetic trait in the human male, male mother needs servility to the female, with the genetic trait becoming maladaptive in response to the extreme environmental changes, even if they had only been social environmental changes, not unlike what happened to the male Irish elk. The suicide spike and climb is a result of that genetic trait not allowing men to adapt sufficiently to a rapidly changing social environment and losing their lives for it. Simultaneously, the female traits of hypergamy and self-interest were being bolstered by this environment. This is what we call sexual conflict. A trait that over time no longer provides a benefit to an animal is considered maladaptive. What can be observed here is called an evolutionary biology sexual conflict, but this sexual conflict is psychological in nature, albeit genetic as well. As stated quite simply, male desire to service the female has become a maladaptive trait, and even in the physical sense, his inclinations to service the female drain him of resources and oftentimes of physical health in the form of heart attack, stress, and in some cases suicide, hence the worst outcome of Fisherian runaway as a trait that, is, that was once beneficial, strictly in a sexually selective process, in the distant past has lost its benefit, costing the well-being, health, and lives of men who possess it, namely the, quote, service the female at all costs trait, as I like to term it. Over the last few decades, we have seen increased suicide, increased unemployment, mental illness, physical illness, and homelessness for men. The uh, service the female at all costs traits trait is destroying men slowly but surely, with the state being complicit in that destruction, as well as women maintaining the status quo, since their biology and their traits compel them to maintain it, whatever the cost to men, after all. No one sheds a tear when the beaten up 84 Honda no longer works, especially when there is a brand spanking new Porsche to replace it. Men are the 84 Honda, and the state is the Porsche. Women see more gain in taking money by working for themselves and by stealing men's money through state-sanctioned divorce than they do in sticking with old arrangements that benefited their hypergamy less so. It's that simple. Now I'd like to talk about the statement made by the caller to uh, AVFM radio wherein he stated that he did not hate women but he hated the gun they had been given. Of course, as previously discussed, women are, metaphorically speaking, uh, pulling the trigger all the time with no encouragement from the outside. They're doing it simply because they can and because it benefits them to do so. But what is important to mention here are the steps forward. Without a doubt, step one must involve disarming women and getting rid of the guns. That should be clear and a given. However, all too many men will be willing to stop there when it comes, when it comes to it, and it's actually not enough. Uh, step two I will call simply uh, empowerment through knowledge. Men must, and I do mean must, reevaluate themselves and their perceptions of women. We currently exist with a genetic legacy that is harming us more than it helps us. It causes us to neglect ourselves, to hate and compete against our fellow men, and to service every wish a woman might utter, in some cases throw away our lives in the process. This is the ultimate result of Fisherian runaway gone bad for the human male. This genetic trait, to serve the female at all costs, is a dead end now, and we can only proceed forward if we acknowledge this for what it is. Yet all around us we see men still trapped in the past. Recall Barbara Russ's latest video where the off-duty police officer refuses to help the man, replying that he was quote-unquote old-fashioned. Old-fashioned indeed. If men do not, through conscious effort, shake off this maladaptive trait, the seeming irresistible desire to serve all things female, it will be not be enough to simply take away the gun because women will not change and will always be willing to pull the trigger should they be given a new gun in the future. What men need to do is to learn how to dodge the bullets by understanding female nature, their own nature, and I have to put a lot of emphasis on that, their own nature, and using this understanding to their advantage. Part of, what will, part of this will involve viewing other men within the context of brotherhood rather than as competitors. Cooperation is key. 
understanding female nature, understanding and understanding our own nature, and developing a supportive and cooperative spirit that trumps eons of biological legacy, this is how we must move forward. But it can only, only be done when we are rigorously committed to intellectual honesty, no matter how unpleasant certain truths might be. Thanks for watching.